jahan and uh, uh, a very warm welcome to each one of you uh, to this uh, webinar uh, a very important webinar on military healthcare philosophy uh, which is a session 1 uh, my special thanks uh, uh, to jan aroda who is the editor imr uh, and distinguished fellow sanjos for uh, having uh, put this together conceptualized it uh, and for the conduct uh, i i uh, my gratitude to the dg afms uh, jan anup benerji uh, for uh, having been having given us uh, uh, blessings to this seminar because without that it wouldn't have happened and for spending your time on a saturday uh, i also welcome uh, jan ak hoda dg afms army uh, lieutenant jan madhuri kanatkar deputy chief of the defense staff medical headquarter ids uh, surgeon by signal rajat uh, data uh, dgms navy air air marshal ms butola dgms air uh, surgeon by signal joy chatterji who is the dg hospital uh, services uh, air marshal pavan kapoor former dgms air uh, lieutenant cs narayanan uh, former desert uh, medical in headquarter ids surgeon by uh, surgeon by signal mb singh former dg of navy uh, major anupam chatterraj uh, additional dg fms hr uh, major s bhatnagar who is adg in the dg fms uh, mr dilip patel who is a founder director of trivector uh, biomedical uh, mr ajay sharma of bharat forge uh, dr rajiv mehta a comrade sadhana nair all the panelists today uh, you know uh, medical has been a very interesting subject uh, especially in this pandemic time it has woken us up Uh, we always talk of force protection we do a seminar on force protection every year year on year uh, but uh, the pandemic has taught that force protection is only not in the uh, conventional domain uh, force protection is not uh, only in the kinetic domain but force protection is equally important uh, in the day to day uh, medical domain especially when you have non traditional uh, security challenges uh, like the pandemic the covid 19 uh, in any case uh, i i do feel Uh, that the armed forces medical services uh, are one of the best uh, uh, for in in india and one of the best in the world uh, i can say that with a conviction uh, having been uh, a, a patient for many years uh, i have been under the knife twelve times uh, which is uh, a sort of a record for uh, in the 40 years i have had five knee surgeries and every time uh, the armed forces medical services have put me up uh, and made me running and uh, the uh, 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 and i did command a, a, a core along the line, line of active control at 5000 meters and around 4500 to 5000 meters and i was walking all along after my knee surgery and uh, uh, it was a major knee surgery, jump injury uh, but that is the strength of our uh, medical core and uh, that is where the force protection comes in they keep the army healthy physically mentally morally uh, i have seen uh, uh, our uh, uh, medical officers our medical uh, paramedics Uh, in the worst of circumstances and i also say that with a conviction that especially uh, for emergency response there is no better organization uh, than our armed forces medical services now, whether it is a casualty to be evacuated casualty to be treated uh, the chain or the, the mass casualties i, I have been twice uh, where we had mass casualties uh, whether it was excises uh, para drops uh, or even when uh, we had uttarakhand uh, floods of the dgm at that time Uh, second we had the uh, ask with the core commander they, they really go out and they do exceedingly well so we have a very uh, uh, effective uh, 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 medical services uh, who are uh, in tune with the thing and and the performance especially what they contributed to uh, in the last uh, uh, five months uh, during the pandemic uh, hats off to them each one of them uh, whether it is in delhi or whether lay or anywhere else Uh, today we face uh, uh, major challenges uh, uh, along our uh, land borders uh, both uh, china what's happening i will not go into the details because it's uh, uh, it's uh, uh, been there uh, but the uh, uh, medical has to be geared up and and they are geared up uh, so this uh, uh, webinar comes at a very opportune time uh, when we look uh, at uh, the overall thing and we reassure each other uh, that yes uh, the medical uh, this thing Uh, our medical services uh, are up to it uh, they are not only present relevant they are future ready and i once again uh, thank uh, the dg sms uh, who is here who spend uh, who is given us time uh, thank you very much sir and we'll start with the session 1 we got four sessions for today uh, session 1 is of course being uh, uh, we have the address by the keyboard address by 
the DGFML on military health and care philosophy. Uh, then we have session two, emerging technologies, protocols uh, for health care in combat. I think that's a very important one, health care in combat. Then we have session three, post-lunch, uh, modernization of military health care infrastructure. And then session four, which is a very, very interesting session, uh, future challenges. Uh, because every day we face uh, new challenges, and especially in the medical field. Uh, with this, I hand over to uh, uh, General uh, Anup Banerjee, uh, the DG, uh, DG of Post Medical Services. Very important webinar. And my personal gratitude to the organizers for letting me be part of this event. And first and foremost, I would like to thank General Bhatia, sir, for his words of encouragement, for his words of recognition that he has provided for the armed forces medical services. Thank you, sir. I'm sure for all those who are listening and for all those who shall listen to your words, it will be the biggest source of encouragement and that moral is going to be sky high after your words. Thank you, sir. And I hope you live up to your expectations. I shall be speaking on military health care philosophy and overview. Since time immediate medical support has been an extremely important part of any operation. Whether we recollect Lord Hanuman's contribution in getting Sanjeevni Bhutti for Lakshmanji, or we are reminded of the medics standing behind the armies in Kautilya's Artha Shastra, there could be no better example of combat medical support. It has been documented in 1642 at the outbreak of English Civil War, but as we appreciate, the onset of this combat medical support has been prehistoric much before any documentation, documented history. What is the triad of philosophy of healthcare? The three components are ethics, the processes, and the people who are responsible for maintenance of healthcare. Let us appreciate that philosophy of healthcare is best approached as an indelible component of human social structures. Healthcare is a dynamic process. It can never remain static. As human civilization evolves, healthcare also has to modernize and update itself to remain relevant in the day to day practice. When we address philosophy of healthcare, we need to ask a few questions. What is health? Who requires healthcare? What should be the basis? for deciding on treatments, hospital stays, drugs, etc. How can healthcare best be administered to the greatest number of people? What are the necessary parameters for quality assurance? What differentiates healthcare from any other service that is engineering or teaching? Healthcare ought to be treated differently from other social goods in a society. In a, it's, it is an institution of which we are all a part, whether we like it or not. At some point in every person's life, a decision has to be made regarding one's health care. Can they afford it? Do they deserve it? Do they need it? Where should they get it from? Do they even want it? And it is this last question which poses the biggest dilemma facing a person. After weighing the pros and cons, one has to take a call whether the benefit outweighs the cost involved. For an optimal healthcare outcome, what is the what are the objectives of healthcare philosophy? The objective is to consolidate the abundance of information technology regarding the ever-changing fields of medicine, nursing and biotechnology. Healthcare philosophy attempts to highlight the primary movers of healthcare system, be it nurses, doctors, allied health professionals, hospital administrators, 
health insurance, the government, and lastly, the patient themselves. What are the components of healthcare philosophy? The two terms are interchangeable. However, medical care addresses the grassroots. It refers to the individualized care we provided to a single patient by a physician or resulting in physician instructions. Whereas at a larger scale, healthcare services encompasses the healthcare of promoting, maintaining and monitoring our resources to families or communities. To be successful, healthcare has to be a community participation. It has to be comprehensive, accessible, economical, social and once again acceptable to all. What are the levels of healthcare? As is well known, it is primary healthcare which in the so-called state or district health administration is restricted to primary healthcare centers. Thereafter, a referral to a secondary healthcare in which the nurses and doctors with, with better infrastructure at this look after these patients at district hospitals and community health center. And should the requirement arise, tertiary healthcare at teaching hospitals and super specialized centers, centers of excellence, centers of competence. Healthcare has to be a teamwork. Together, each achieves more. And therefore, the combined competence should lead to a combined or a common goal. And therefore, healthcare team is a group of persons who share a common health goal towards achievement of which each member of the team contributes according to his or her competence and skills, respecting the functions of each other. Whereas a healthcare team in a hospital or a community consists of doctors, nurses, therapists, pharmacists, dietitians, social workers, technicians, and even family members who form part of the healthcare system today. Leadership is an essence to assess, motivate, and get the best potential out of all members. So therefore, a team leader should have the qualities to evaluate the team adequately, to know the motivation levels, and to stimulate to get the best result out of each. The Armed Forces Medical Services has some special characteristics, as I shall bring out. So as we know, the primary role of the armed forces medical services is to maintain the armed forces at the highest level of medical fitness. As we know, the terrain and the climatic conditions are absolutely variable along the length and breadth of the country. And this is where the tuning, the physiology of the system of the patients has to be taken into account. A few more characteristics of the armed forces is that they are the Clientele is exposed to various health threats, again across the length and breadth of the country, depending on the environment, altitude, climatic features, things are so different in the entire country called India. Therefore, the Armed Forces Medical Services is geared to provide an all-encompassing package of preventive, promotive and curative health services wherever our troops are deployed. In addition, the Armed Forces Medical Services also has the unique characteristics in that we take care of the families of the soldiers, that is what we call dependents, as well as the retired Armed Forces and the families who are very respected veterans. Our association, our commitment continues in the entire spectrum as mentioned above. So, therefore, how do we run our healthcare systems? As mentioned for the uh, civil and state health, health uh, resources, we have primary, secondary and tertiary healthcare in a very distinctly laid out uh, uh, so-called uh, evolved network. Primary healthcare is provided at our medical inspection rooms in the army, sick base in the navy, a basic uh, interaction with the doctor and the patients. Thereafter, we come to mid-level uh, zonal or subzonal hospitals, that is the secondary healthcare echelon, and thereafter, should a patient require, there's an excellent referral system, obviously free of cost, 
to our tertiary healthcare that is the command hospitals and the centers of excellence excellence at uh, bombay bangalore and delhi hr so we have a seamless evolution of primary secondary and tertiary healthcare in the arms of medical service another characteristics of in of healthcare delivery in the arms of medical services is we lay proper respect to preventive medicine in that we ensure enhanced physical fitness by way of physical training games we ensure prophylactic interventions by our vaccination and uh, schedule we ensure that all patients are checked every year by various levels of medical examination we also have special medical screening before our troops are launched into challenging areas of operations as mentioned mentioned earlier we have a variety of environmental challenges related to temperature humidity and the altitude so we are involved with the patients from home to tomb to simplify right from recruitment that is a time a sailor or a uh, officer joins us from the civil stream taking care of him in his entire span of service then after looking after him his health a commitment that we have after retirement till his death there couldn't be a better example of a follow up system that we have the documents are kept in the record one can have a easily easy referral to his past medical history and the accountability and the uh, commitment is always there uh, depiction of the components of the healthcare we we for force health protection what we insist on is proper emphasis on nutrition preventive healthcare primary secondary and tertiary levels of care rehabilitation should there be any injury after combat medical support and otherwise so what is the way forward as was brought out in the initial slides one cannot rest on one's laurels healthcare is a dynamic process so one has to upgrade keeping the requirements of the environment so therefore what are we looking at we are looking at a rapid escalation escalation in cost of health care we are looking at a changing environment with increased emphasis on performance management we are looking at unprecedented challenges facing the armed forces at home and missions abroad that require it to assume new roles and responsibilities so therefore the need to transform the medical force so that future medical support is fully aligned with changing war fighting doctrines and other eventualities so to conclude we have a change in scenario in which what is most required is involvement partnerships common goals and most importantly recognizing the needs of the client a disease does not define a patient but rather the patient is an individual with a condition asking the medical community for opinions and guidance therefore as they say patient is king there has to be a shift from doctor led to patient centered practices from organ system to an entire wholeness or a wellness of the system from head to toe and not only caring or addressing the health or from taking disease from health to entire healing medicine and military are steeped in centuries of culture that have served both well however it is these very cultures that make it difficult for change to occur thus change comes with difficulty and can only be achieved with a shift in perspective thank you and jai hey uh, gentlemen thank you so much uh, coming straight from the dg Our for the medical services, uh, we couldn't have got a better perspective of the uh, medical philosophy, uh, which is definitely in tune with the war fighting doctrines, the war fighting capabilities. Uh, they are the medical services are very integral and important uh, part of our uh, war fighting doctrine. Uh, and the best part is uh, that given the resources, uh, the limitation of resources, uh, I think our medical services have really optimized them. Uh, and today we have a uh, 
uh, medical care in the combat zone, uh, which is one of the best medical care at every uh, uh, echelon which is there. And uh, that is what the optimization of the resources has been done. And as Jill uh, Manny said, uh, we are uh, future ready. Uh, we are looking at the way ahead and his way forward has been uh, given. So that, that, thank you very much. Uh, I, would I would not like to repeat what you said. Uh, it's been very clear, very categorical, and very comprehensive. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, next, uh, uh, so I, I hand over to uh, Major uh, uh, Chattaraj. I think we have uh, ADG, ADG uh, DGSMS uh, HR, uh, which is a very important functionary. Uh, so we have, we are, uh, uh, the floor is over to you. Thank you very much. A very good morning to all the delegates. It's an honor to be speaking under the chairmanship of General Bhatia, who was my GOC in 25 infantry division when I was the registrar in the hospital. I will be covering in the next 10 minutes or so this uh, vast topic of military medical ethics and will be briefly touching upon the definition of ethics and the need for ethics, healthcare ethics, and finally talk a little bit about military medical ethics. The dictionary, the dictionary meaning of ethics, uh, ethics is defined basically as the moral principles that govern a person or a group of persons in their behavior as well as in the conduct of an activity. Ethics seek to resolve questions of human morality by defining concepts such as good or evil, right or wrong, virtue and vice, justice and crime. We need to learn about ethics because they guide our decisions, make us who we are, and determine our future. As we are all aware, there are many ethical values, justice, honesty, empathy, compassion, respect and responsibility are some of the most important ones. Now, medical ethics actually require the physician to do what is best for the patient and put the patient's interests above his own. There are certain pillars of healthcare ethics and I'll be covering them one by one. The first one is non-maleficence. Non-maleficence, which means essentially do no harm. That means the patient's condition should not worsen. We generally talk about physical harm, but the harm can come through a myriad ways. It can be because of administrative decisions, like having less number of skilled workers, having equipment which are either malfunctioning or there's a lack of it, which may cause adverse patient outcomes and also harm can cause can be caused as a, as a result of negligence, which can be because of omission or commission. The next pillar is beneficence, which means that we must always act for the benefit of the patient, which actually translates into the greatest good to the greatest number. The third principle, which is an important one and which is to an extent affected in the military, is autonomy which essentially means the patient owns his life. We may take a decision not to harm him or to do benefit to him, but if this decision does not involve the patient, autonomy is violated. The duty of the physician is to treat the patient's illness, not to judge them for what they are. I'll give an example. If a patient is a chain smoker and you're, you, it is required to make him stop smoking to improve his health, then it is only towards that and not as a moral lecture to the patient to stop smoking for some other reasons. Coming to the next pillar, it's justice. Justice can be both procedural as well as distributive. Justice, an example of a procedural justice, which is often seen in, in busy OPDs, is a question that arises in the mind of the patients who are waiting. The dear patient jumped the queue without valid medical reason. And the, an example of distributive justice would be a decision as to how much time a doctor can give to a patient in an OPD. The last principle of healthcare ethics, ethics is, of course, confidentiality, which is, of course, one of the most more inviolable ones, but which also in the military is violated to some extent or other, which will come to subsequently. Now, what are the determinants of military medical ethics? Now, for the first, the, the first of them is, the, is this problem of dual loyalty. The physician in the military is, has an allegiance to his patients as well as to the government through the military. The doctor essentially takes a lot of oaths. He takes the medical oath, he takes the Hippocratic oath, 
and he is also when he joins the army, he takes a military oath when he is commissioned. The Geneva Convention comes in or kicks in in a combat scenario. Then there are, of course, the value lists of the military profession as such, such as leadership, loyalty, discipline, and obedience. We are, of course, the ethics, ethics, the medical ethics will also be determined by issues of national security, law, politics, and increased moral sensitivity. We are also exposed, and our ethics will also be determined by the public scrutiny, media glare, and public opinion in, in present times. Military effectiveness and loyalty to organization and colleagues still hold central place in the military ethics and also in the military medical ethics. We have already discussed dual loyalty, then physicians have responsibilities and are accountable both to, both to their patients and to a third party. And when these responsibilities and accountabilities are incompatible, there's always a role conflict between the clinical professional duties up to a patient and obligations expressed or implied, real or perceived to the interests of a third party. In, in this context, of course, it's the military command. Every doctor has to take the Hippocratic Oath, which actually all the entire the essence of the oath is basically that the doctors should work in the interest of their patients. Every doctor passing out of the military of the medical schools in this country have to abide by the code of medical ethics, which is laid down by the Indian Medical Council Act, and are also liable to punishment of the disciplinary action on violation of this code of medical ethics. The military oath is, however, somewhat different. Here, as a rule, it stresses the loyalty to a head of state or the constitution of the republic and the people. But the military medical person have to choose between the responsibility for their patients and the demands of the military. They sometimes have, the, have their obligations to their patients overridden by their sense of military duty. We'll be covering these in the subsequent slides. The Geneva Conventions kick in during wartime and the, uh, the provisions are very clear that anybody who's sick and wounded of the armed forces, be it our own or be it of the enemy. Wounded, sick and shipwrecked members of the armed forces, prisoners of war and civilians have to be cared for in an equal manner. Person taking care of the wounded shall ignore the nationality of the uniform when they're taking care of them. If I may say so, the core issue in military medical ethics is whether the military physician should adopt a military role specific ethic which favors military interests exclusively or assume a medical role specific ethic which favors patients military medical interests exclusively. We all know that in war it is the principle of salvage returning as many soldiers to duty as quickly as possible not the medical need which is a severe dilemma facing the military physician and this is the guiding principle of all medical efforts. War therefore do transform medical ethics. There are certain points or certain food for thought. There is an oft asked question, often asked by the military commanders as well as the doctor himself is often forced to ask himself, is the military physician a physician first and a military officer second? Then, if that be so, then when there is a conflict between the best interests of the patient and the success of the military mission, which is the interest that the military physician must serve? A thought process is the ethical principles of medicine make medical practice under conditions of military control fundamentally dysfunctional and unethical. The counter thought is the military health professional's first and overruling identity and priority is that of a health professional. In this connection, I'd like to point out certain ethical dilemmas that military physicians face. We are all aware of the concept of triage, which is the prioritization of casualties, and we are all aware that there are three Priorities, priority one, two, and three. Priority one and two being the ones which are which require immediate attention of the of the uh, you know higher medical echelons and therefore have to be evacuated first. And the priority three is the is the walking wounded. However, there is an unwritten priority called priority four, which involves the moribund patients, and that is where the ethical dilemma comes as to whether to look after them or to let them die. 
street wounds caused by prisoner abuse is another dilemma that faces the military physician. The soldier ordered by a military physician to receive an investigational vaccine or a drug. For example, in case, in case there is a requirement of soldiers to move into higher altitude rapidly, then they may have to take some drugs and move. A military physician is ordered to treat wounded soldiers who can return to combat quickly before treating others who possibly may be requiring treatment more urgent or more severe or more, you know, uh, uh, definitive kind of treatment is required for them. A military psychiatrist is asked to order a psychologically traumatized soldier to return to combat. A military psychiatrist is ordered to breach the confidentiality of his soldier patients for the good of the soldier's unit. His psychiatrist, which is actually, you know, a breach of the pillar called confidentiality in healthcare ethics. A military physician is ordered to evaluate a prisoner before the prisoner undergoes that is aggressive interrogation, being party to it. A military physician remains at a mobile hospital on the battlefield after the unit is forced to retreat and the hospital comes under hostile fire. And then there are of course the moral, moral dilemmas, options to exaggerate wounds and categorize them as threatening to life, limb or eyesight when actually they are not. Continuing with the dilemmas, medical personnel regularly have to choose, especially in CI ops, whom to help first, a seriously wounded insurgent or a civilian or a somewhat less seriously wounded colleague. They may have to bend rules and use medical means earmarked for treating military personnel to help a civilian in need of medical attention. Some of the ethical dilemmas that are faced by the physicians in military medicine, especially during combat, are because the military physician cannot escape the situation by resigning in his post as his civilian colleague can do. Perhaps one of the best known examples of military medical ethical dilemma from World War II is the decision during the North African campaign to provide penicillin first to troops with sexually transmitted diseases rather than to seriously wounded troops <clears throat> because of, although it was the antibiotic of choice during the time because the former could be quickly returned to combat. Therefore, there's another, another situation where the, you know, in both wartime and peacetime, a military physician almost always outranks the soldier patient reinforcing traditional medical paternalism with the soldier's requirement to follow orders. This is where perhaps the principle of ethical healthcare, that's autonomy of the patient is violated. In wartime, on the other hand, the physician uniform will naturally bond with his or her fellow soldiers, seeing the enemy as them versus us and therefore may not be able to live up to the requirements of the Geneva Conventions. In field conditions, patients have to balance goods and harms that is determining what is best for their patients, be it immediate or delayed treatment, air or ground evacuation, continued service with the unit of evacuation out of the combat zone, and of course the utilization of very scarce resources as well as equitable resource allocation in the more forward frontline positions. Decisions on who to evacuate without medical support, which would definitely equate with death, who should utilize the limited ventilator facilities available in a forward hospital, they have to be taken. What is medically right? or a medically right uh, may not always be desirable and may not be feasible either. Therefore, the, but there is a bottom line nevertheless and there are some non-negotiable pro prohibitions such as a military physician cannot, cannot be you know, a, a, a party to murder and torture and the obligations of physicians to abide by the international humanitarian law, most notably the Geneva Conventions is also non-negotiable. To conclude, ethical decisions can be difficult. Ethical decisions are not always clear. Cultural and moral standards make ethical conduct difficult to determine. Sometimes one must choose between the lesser of the two evils or greater of two goods. There are often tensions between what is best for one individual and what is best for the group. And of course, ethical decisions require diligent effort and courage. Perhaps the last word in this particular topic would be, we perhaps need military physicians who can identify as closely as possible with the military, so that they can carry out the vital part they play in meeting the needs of the mission. Military necessity only rarely conflicts with medical ethics, and it is usually during combat only, but that can always be overcome by applying a version of the just war theory <coughs> that military action is necessary to preserve the nation. Under those circumstances, active participation on the part of military physicians in the defense of the nation is both honorable and ethical. Thank you. Jai. 
thank you very much uh, jan chandra thank you so very much uh, uh, what was i say old colleague so uh, it has really been uh, an education today uh, listening to the dilemmas which our medical officers uh, face on a daily basis uh, uh, honestly even after all these services uh, i knew of some of the dilemmas but uh, i did not know that this is the extent of uh, uh, the dilemmas uh, which are being faced uh, by our uh, medical uh, officers uh, almost on a daily basis on account of our deployment on account of our operational requirements uh, i do recollect that uh, uh, i was very harsh once and uh, today i, I regret that uh, we had uh, two of our soldiers injured in a fire fight and uh, two terrorists also injured uh, and uh, the ceo field ambulance told me categorically he said sir uh, i need to evacuate the terrorists first other he will die Uh, I said I couldn't care less. You evacuate our soldiers first. I couldn't care less whether they died or not. And uh, that night, uh, that terrorist died, and it was a death in custody because he died in our custody. And later on, I realized that what our medical officers do and say uh, that we should take it uh, with the with the highest uh, regard and ensure that the decisions are taken. And I did I, that was a lesson learned to me. And today, listening to you, I think it was uh, just uh, uh, getting back to that. I think we just just go. This has to, uh, you know, uh, 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 maybe it, it, this this is a lecture we need to take at the high command force or the CDM uh, or even at the NDC uh, for people to realize uh, what our doctors uh, go through uh, uh, psychologically and physically when they have to take such decisions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, we do have. Yeah, uh, I'll hand over to Colonel Neeraj uh, Garg now, who is the Staff Officer to the DG AFMS. Uh, he will be speaking to us on philosophy of echelon-based combat medical support system. Uh, over to uh, Colonel Garg. Presenting on the topic of the Echelon based combat medic support system, as said by Brigadier Rupert Smith, that the casualties are the certainty of any operational plan. If the enemy moves a good plan and yours, if it is not. So, as we know, a uh, robust combat medic support system is a cornerstone of success for any operational or military plan. However, the country has not faced a conventional war from last almost 50 years now. So there were two limited confrontations at the northern and the eastern border, but with the growing menace of uh, terrorism and the nationalism, the troops are always operating in a CICT environment. Thus, the requirement of a robust combat medical support system cannot be negated at any point. So, what about the combat medical support system? It's the provision of the essential life and a life-saving care during active military operation or a limited conflict zone. The aim of a combat medic support system is to minimize loss of life and limb, prevent maximum loss of function, and an early return to duty. Second principle is the provision of an external base care about which I'll be talking in my presentation. The emphasis of an essential life-saving surgery at the shortest possible time. Constant monitoring of casualty in route during evacuation. And keep the forward medical echelon free of casualties so that the commanders can focus upon the operations. So the bottom line is to ensure the survival, enhancing the survivability of the soldier on the battlefield, either by empowering of the personal present at the point of injury that the competent user or his body, or to train the battlefield medical assistants. And the second aspect is to ensure a robust echelon based combat medical support system from the FDI to the definitive medical care facility in the rear. Uh, uh, what makes the difference between a civilian or a trauma uh, in a military setup? So, in a military setup, the difference is of uh, primary uh, treatment given at the point of injury by the combatant himself. Thus, uh, thus it the significance of providing the basic training to the battlefield nursing assistant as well as empowering the soldier himself. The 
Since so our combat medic support system, it should be in proximity. The pro it should be as close to the operations. The responsiveness, the continuity, the flexibility and coordinated operations. It should be in proximity with the operational plans. The early medical intervention and the speedy evacuation to the rear medical echelons. Thus, a trauma management in a combat situation differs significantly from what is being provided during a peacetime. Because in a combat scenario, the focus is on life and limb saving surgeries and to stabilize the patient so that the patient can be evacuated to the next level of care. There are various issues that are being faced in, provide, in providing a robust combat medical support system. First is the time constraints because uh, time is a very important variable in a combat scenario. So, uh, we should all talk about the platinum 10 minutes and the golden hour. So it is very important to provide the necessary treatment in a limited time frame. The combat scenario itself is various. Good morning, Aurora. Good morning. Yeah, yeah. The combat scenario further imposes various challenges. Secondly, the hostile environment and scarcity of resources is always a challenging situation for the medics. Right. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, may, may, may I just intervene for a minute? Uh, may I request uh, all who are the participants, the speaker, uh, to switch over the mic, please? Uh, request switch over, switch over your mic, please. You only have to you, you click on that and you enter your email and then submit, and it is open and it's free, and you will really automatically join. Uh, sir, can you switch over mic, sir? Okay, then that might be a firewall issue. Try on the phone also. Try on the phone also. Try on the phone also, but use uh, Chrome. Uh, use Chrome. Uh, and it may be a firewall. Uh, uh, give, a, give a minute, I think I'll just. Uh, or, um, you know, that antivirus. Yes, uh, yeah, switch on the mic, please. That may be. So otherwise, uh, uh, can you switch on the mic? 95 people are already joined and listening. I'm just sending you once again. I just sent you. By Ravi, I'm Major General Ravi Arora. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I think you can start now. I'll ask you to switch on the mic. Thank you. Uh, I'll just again start with the issues and challenges. Uh, there are various constraints in provisioning of an efficient. Uh, and a robust combat medic support system. The trauma casualties presents a unique challenge because time is an important variable. It's very important to utilize the platinum 10 minutes and the golden hour to, uh, for a favorable outcome. The combat scenario itself poses various challenges for the healthcare providers. Then the hostile environment and the scarcity of resources at the FDL and subsequently at various other uh, op locations. The geographical distances and other tactical limitations also pose great hindrance. Then the other important consideration is the limited uh, number of uh, uh, trained medical manpower at the FDL. Because a uh, trained medical manpower in a form of an RM or a nursing assistant cannot always be present on an FDL. Thus the importance of BFNAs and the buddy system cannot be negated. The limitation in carriage of medical equipment to the forward location the operational interference or the constraints in rendering life saving trauma at the op location and inexperienced medical care given with basic skills in life support. What I'm talking about are the BFNA, which are a very important uh, person in this complete chain of evacuation, and uh, they are they have, they have got uh, just a limited uh, expertise in the providing basic first aid. So, the solution. It should be to develop the capabilities and competencies in the combatants and the limited number of medical care providers that are, uh, that are available at the FDL and at the forward locations. Internal authorization of the medical person on the establishment of combat arms and combat support arms for delivering any immediate life saving intervention at the point of uh, wounding. But it may not be a viable option considering the teeth to tail ratio. That means increasing the inherent authorization of a medical component in a combat arm 
which is which is about a primary role of providing a combat role may not be taken in a right perspective once we talk about the teeth to tail ratio. Thus, the action plan should be for utilizing the platinum 10 minutes, the role of self and the body care for providing the basic life support, the combat survival skill and the first aid kit with the soldier himself, followed by treatment by the BFNAs with, who is having the advanced first aid kit, BFNA training, BFNA first aid bag and subsequently by the RMO in form of an ATLS and the advanced life support. The emphasis should be increasing the competencies of the BFNAs for utilizing of the platinum 10 minutes and upgrading the RAPs and increasing the competencies of the RMO and then uh, for a SPD evacuation improvising our gas evac system. Now a few words about the echelon base that is the first echelon uh, which is the FDL thus the all combatants should be trained and equipped to deliver the first uh, the life saving first aid measures the role of battlefield nursing assistant who is also a combatant but trained in primary and the first aid should be should not be negated and augmentation of the functional capabilities or and the structure and process of a combat medic support in the forward areas for enabling, enabling a favorable care outcomes. The next echelon is the RAP where it's a first point of contact between a trained medical professional that is an RMO who can provide uh, ATLS or uh, advanced trauma life support and can play and can be a game changer in providing a necessary life saving treatment to the soldier within a golden hour. And all the RMPs are now equipped with basic life saving equipment and the life saving drugs. Just a snapshot of an RMP. The next station which comes is the advanced dressing station, uh, which is uh, there to support a brigade size force. The structure of this medical support is customized to the size of the force, terrain of deployment, and the nature of combat operation. The ADS is designed and staffed to function under field condition and be flexible to move and relocate with speed as per operational necessity to support the combat operations of the support force. It should meet the matching mobility of the fighting forces. Thus, it can be it should be a it can either be a tent based or a dugin or as per the overall it should be a vehicle based. Just another snapshot of the ADS. Next in the next echelon is the forward surgical center. It is the ADS which is upgraded with the inherent surgical component. It is the forward most medical echelon which can undertake a life or a limb saving surgery. Though there are limited surgical capability, but the importance is really important because the surgery that is provided at the FSC can really save the life of the soldier if the evacuation to the rear medical echelon is not possible. Just to another pictures of the OT on wheels, which are now uh, basically uh, it's the new innovations or which are now coming for uh, providing matching mobility to the for armored formations. Next, which uh, next thing which comes for the echelon based healthcare is the significance of a robust evacuation system from a first responder to the forward surgical center and to a definitive care facility. Uh, the integral. Uh, Transport that is the ambulances which are integral to the forward medical echelon, they are uh, however they are adequate but may need augmentation in excess with more intense operation. Air evacuation in form of captured evacuation from FDL to the FSC and fixed wing rotary aircraft from an FSC to a rear uh, tertiary care facility should be explored. Raising of ambulance trains for move of casualty to the predefined destination hospital depth area. Uh, are being done to decongest the forward hospitals. The main constraint is the limited availability of a manpower for carriage of casualty uh, by the stretcher bearer from the FDL to the RAP or from the FDL to the car post. Just few pictures of the ambulance train. Then comes the important issue of augmentation of medical resources during active ops. The mock plan should be there for augmentation of medical personnel and surgical teams through milking policy. There should be the tier 1 and a tier 2 affiliation. The tier 1 affiliation should be from the nearest 
uh, hospital to ensure availability of the trained surgeon and anesthetist at the FSC within the shortest possible time frame and the satire to affiliation to subsequently place these uh, surgical teams at the border static hospital. The importance of prices, expansion beds and raising of the mobile technical support platform. Another important aspect is uh, MOUs with the local civilian uh, healthcare organization for providing ambulance vehicles and blood uh, during the time of active ops. So the take home message is the essence and the goal for combat medic support or care in the battlefield of future conflict irrespective of the ter terrain consideration shall remain as follows. That is ensuring medical presence at all the levels that means from FDL till right up to the all the echelons, save lives, clear the battlefield of casualties, provide state of the art medical care to ensure uh, early return to the duties as well as to keep the morale of the soldiers high, to ensure early return and to maintain the health of the dependent client. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kanga. Thank you very much. Uh uh, very uh, educator. Uh, we are a day short of uh, the Kargil Vijay Divas, and uh, uh, having been there uh, during uh, uh, just before uh, uh, the war ended, uh, I was there from about uh, uh, 17th to 26th July, uh, and thereafter, uh, one of the you know uh, 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 the most morale boosting uh, factors out there uh, was a medical support system. Uh, they, the, the way our casualties, and we had a whole lot of uh, injuries about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 1150 plus, and uh, the, the way they were uh, evacuated and treated and so many lives were saved. So, so that is the uh, uh, combat uh, uh, echelon which you're talking about. And of course, we all know about the golden hour. Uh, thank you very much for a real uh, uh, education listening to you again uh, on this aspect. So good morning, everyone. So I'd like to be thankful to IMR. Major General Ravi Arora for organizing this beautiful event, mainly focusing on the military healthcare. Also, a bit thankful to DGFMS and the other medical officer staff. So, myself, Pranut Shetty, General Manager Defense for Surgivare Limited. So, we are a 38 year old company, mainly into the life saving medical kits. And our since last 10 to 12 years, for mainly focus is on the combat medical products. So we are already been supplying to DGFMS, DGFMS and all the armed forces depots. A lot of our combat medical products are already been deployed on the field. And as Colonel Neeraj Garg had said, uh, it's very important to have the entire medical kits, the BFNA kits, the individual first aid kits and the basic first aid kits with each and every soldier so that at the critical stage of time, these kind of products can be used and can easily be shared the soldiers' lives. So we are talking about the life-saving medi combat medical kits. Uh, till that, all the conventional methods were being used to save a soldier's life. But from last five to 10 years, we have been saying, and we are the only Indian company who manufacture these combat medical products. And we are being supplying to the armed forces and saving their lives. So <laughs> when we talk about these casualty scenario in the armed forces, Majorly, we can see it into the JNK territory and few of the Northeast territories where a lot of casualties have been there. And a lot of time, the battalions face uh, huge issues <coughs> to evacuate the soldiers over there. So at the time of evacuation, usually it takes a longer time for the ambulances to reach out to the casualty center and again take back to the nearest casualty care. So many times, what happens is many of the soldiers lose their lives mainly because of the loss of the blood. So we have got many such products to take control of uh, the combat casualty. So we have got a, a new design product called as Tholok chest seal, which may majorly been used at the time of a chest, chest injury. Simultaneously, we have the universal splint over here, which usually helps in bone dislocation or a fracture at the time of, it can happen at the time of training to the soldiers as well. So apart from that, we have the tourniquet, which is again a life-saving product, which basically helps in gunshot injuries or a blast injuries to control the bleeding. So many times we see a lot of this Chinese stuff getting into the market, uh, which are not reliable. And we are the only Indian company who manufactures this, this tourniquet and being supplied to the armed forces. Apart from that, we have this compression bandage for limbs. 
again as per aurora he had said it is very important to save a life and a limb so this compression bandages for limbs usually helps to control the bleeding and to protect the wound apart from that we have different types of kits when we talk about kits this is a individual first aid kit individual first aid kit can be mainly used by the individual soldier he can carry along with him so that in if there is no any body support or any medical support he can usually use it on his own so apart from that we have this bfna kit that's the battlefield nursing assistant kit where the medical staff can carry along with them in case in case of a mass in, mass casualty over there on the battlefield so i'd like to show you a basic first aid kit this is at this size which is very handy which can be carried out with the medical officers or the nas along with them so it is fully equipped with the life saving products which has got the tourniquets the compression bandages the hemostats are there into this they have the cpr mask we have a chest seal everything is been packed in one single small bag which can be kept on to their hooks on the belts of the vest and be carried along with them so these are very handy and we are the only manufacturers in india today to make these kind of kits and we have already been supplied to the armed forces in the past so apart from that we have the individual first aid kits again it can be carried with a individual soldier so that if there is any casualty to him and if there is no any body support or any medical support to him he can only save his life by using these kind of products along with him uh, first thing i would like to say i am very humbled to be and even honored to be in the presence of such luminaries as all of you from the armed forces uh, today you know we always tend to take health for granted in our civilian world and only when there is trouble we think of the doctors Uh, similarly so it is with air we generally take it for granted that it is always there for us and it's only in the last few years we have started getting worried about the air and we know that it is a silent killer with 2017 reporting nearly 1.2 million early deaths in india just due to air pollution and india is possibly the most polluted country in the world when we talk of infectious diseases we know the facts that india leads in tuberculosis the air one of the most uh, uh, body some airborne infection and the number of cases in the world is rising uh, dramatically having said that today we now also have the fear of sars cov 2 with the number of infections now that it is quite clear that it is airborne and then these aerosols or droplets settle down becoming fomites but it primarily becomes an airborne infection so what is the concern about tuberculosis is that it is it, it remains in the uh, person can get infected and can be a carrier and whenever the immune system is low gets infected and these reports show that people working in healthcare workers are highly susceptible to these infections with the laboratory workers according to this report 78.9% are carriers of tb so this is a cause for concern and this clearly shows that in the healthcare settings along with the general uh, environmental conditions we need to try and clean up the air having said that in the hospital settings we have a whole list of microorganisms which can cause nosocomial infections these include the bacteria the fungi and the viruses and as much as possible we all know that whenever there is any kind of a surgical procedure or as a patient is in the icu we wish to get the patient to move out of the icu as soon as possible because we know that there is a risk of hospital acquired infections and we also have a society for hospital acquired infection society realizing how serious this threat is so we do need to control airborne infections now how are these airborne infections transmitted well it is primarily when we speak we sneeze we cough and the size of droplets that are released determine uh, where these droplets go so if there are large droplets they quickly fall down to the floor or any surface smaller droplets go further ahead and the aerosols or the dried air droplet nuclei keep circulating in the air and therefore can infect anybody now most of us now a uh, large number of places the rooms are air conditioned we have high ventilation air conditioning units what happens there well if these infectious droplet nuclei are present in the air then they go into the circulation and enter the hvac systems and therefore they not only get restricted in the room but they spread on to the neighboring rooms or 
the entire system. Uh, these HVAC systems are uh, do have air HEPA filters and other filtration units to restrict. But the problem is that if these are not efficiently maintained, then we are spreading infections from one group to the other group. So this becomes a major maintenance of these HVAC systems is a big necessity. And unfortunately, very often they are not really very well maintained. And often the filters in the HVAC systems get blocked. And uh, this, in fact, aggravates the possible cause of infections. So today we have multiple systems of air purification. And before I go to talk about the new technology that we have, I wanted to just speak about the general principles behind air purification systems. They generally fall into two categories, the trap category, where you are using things like filters, which trap the microorganisms from going into the uh, specific environment, and the other where you actually destroy the organism. So naturally, a destruction technology is always better because the trap technology uh, what would happen is that if they get blocked there, they'll accumulate. And if they accumulate, they could not prevent further, uh, 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 will prevent the purpose of cleaning up the air and add on, they can themselves become a source of infection. So the most common is when we use the high efficiency particulate air filter and the ultra low particulate air filters. These are in the different uh, filtration units. They are used in workstations when we work with high infective material. But the problem is, like I said earlier, the microbes can accumulate in the filters. They can block the filters. And if not uh, cleaned regularly, they can themselves become a source of infection. And this would be the risk would be much, much higher than in a normal condition. And there are also many viruses whose sizes are so much smaller that they cannot even uh, they can easily pass through even the ALPA filters. Then we come to the charcoal filters, which are primarily used for the trapping of the volatile organic compounds. So primarily this help in the uh, polluted environments, but they have no role to play in the uh, microbial infections. Uh, very commonly used is UV irradiation. So we have uh, the uh, UV lights placed and the principle behind UV irradiation is that it prevents uh, the DNA replication or, or RNA viruses also by causing a dimerization of the thymine thymine. So when the replication of the organism takes place, it is not possible. However, it can only act on the organisms which are in the line of sight of that UV light. So if there are organisms either above or below the line of sight, then they do not get destroyed. Secondly, then actually if there is a cluster of dust around which the organisms are present, then they do not get affected. And these UV lamps need to be replaced regularly. And the UV light does not differentiate between replicating DNA of microbes and humans. So if we are exposed to it, then it is harmful to human beings. And therefore, we also cannot use it in congested rooms where you do not have a high ceiling. And if there is a lot of people, then again, this UV radiation can be harmful to humans. So it can be primarily be used in empty rooms. Then we have the ionizing technology, which primarily uses superoxide radicals, uh, which destroy anything that comes in particle. But then again, when the organisms are in clumps, it doesn't work. So this way we have many technologies. One of this is photocatalytic oxidation, which is a combination of UV light as well as the uh, photocatalytic uh, titan titanium oxide. And in this case, again, it goes through the bacteria, breaks them up into radicals. But again, these are superoxide radicals. And if they are in the environment, they can affect the human beings. So having given this background, we still have technologies which can filter. But if not maintained, uh, they can be harmful. On the other hand, we have technologies which are a little more effective, but then they affect humans. So we have this new technology of plasma technology. And here it is the use of, uh, which was, has been used in many, many uh, systems, but it is very recently being used in the biological systems. What happens here is that, the uh, I'll just go to what exactly is plasma. So plasma is the fourth state of matter. We are familiar with the solid, liquid, gaseous phase. And in this fourth state of matter, what happens is that whenever plasma hits any, any kind of uh, molecule, it breaks it down into free radicals highly reactive ions and free electrons. And these free radicals, highly reactive ions and the uh, ions generally will attack anything that comes in contact with it and destroys it. And this is what plasma does. Plasma does not differentiate between any kind of material it comes in contact with. Uh, the, 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 the use of this technology in air sterilization and air disinfection came into picture 
when a novel method was used, which is called the dielectric barrier discharge plasma. So in this system, what happens is that the plasma is generated within these coils. And because it is generated in the coils, it does not affect anybody else into the room, in the room, but only the air that gets through these coils. Secondly, this is cold plasma. There's no heat generated. So this is an image of plasma which is generated under the surface of the coils. So within the coil, all the plasma that is generated and any molecule, including microbes that get inside this coil are thoroughly destroyed. So the unit that we have is there are different kinds of units. This in this technology, what we have is there are six such coils. And therefore, when the microbes go through these coils, within a few seconds or milliseconds, they are destroyed. So these are the images of the units. The size of the, all of these use the cold plasma technology. This is called the MD200, MD800, and the different 1050. These are used depending on the size of the rooms and the level of infections one anticipates. So these can be used in small rooms. Uh, these are in slightly uh, larger rooms of 400 to 600 square feet. And these are in much larger rooms of nearly 1,000 square feet. So this is definitely what would strongly recommended in hospital environments, but in the smaller settings where there is a relatively high risk or one wants cleaner air, one can use these kind of uh, technologies. Now, how does this system work is that initially there is a pre-filter. So air passes through this pre-filter and any large uh, dust particles, whatever is dropping, then it enters directly into these plasma coils. And here, within a few seconds, these organisms or whatever that enters in are thoroughly destroyed. And I'll show you some visuals of how it is done. And then this clean air is moved to uh, the HEPA filter. So any kind of organic molecules that are, uh, sorry, they, they go to the car uh, carbon filter first. So any kind of organic molecules that are generated, the VOCs, are absorbed. And finally, it comes through the HEPA filter and you have clean air coming out into the room. So all these things are actually done very, very quickly. And this is also provided with many fans. So the fans simply absorb the air with the room. And plug it in. And there is minimal maintenance required with especially just the HEPA and the carbon filter. Hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, are you sharing your screen? Yes, ma'am. Because we can't see the slides. Oh. No. It shows the presentation is on. Ma'am, we need to just click on that and share your screen. Go to present off, select your entire screen, and then share. Oh, I go to present, but I'm on present on, so I cancel it. Oh, sorry, I have to apologize to you, Raju. Pardon me for this. I did it. Sure, ma'am. So, this is the plasma uh, the, the air purification technologies, which I just spoke about. These are the different units of the air purification systems, which uses old plasma. So, here we have the filters going, uh, the air initially being filtered. And subsequently, it runs through these plasma coils where anything that enters into these coils is thoroughly destroyed. And whatever is destroyed is absorbed through these carbon filters and finally purified and comes out through these HEPA filters. Now, what, how do these uh, systems add? And just to give you a compilation of how efficacious the system is, it has been shown that you can destroy the influenza virus in 10 to 20 minutes in a space of 28.5 uh, millicube. Uh, 19, there's a 99% reduction. If you look at tuberculosis, there's a 97% reduction. This was done with uh, tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, a surrogate uh, mycobacterium smegmatis. <coughs> then if you look at MRSA, there's nearly a 99.9% .9 reduction. So these are the different models, as I said earlier. This is the 1050 model. If you look at fungus, as, uh, fungal spores, as per Schmitz nature falls, 99.9% .9 can be reduced in 30, 30 minutes. And even the VOC composition decreases. And if you look at particulate matter, that too decreases. So all in all, we see that these units are able to uh, totally reduce the uh, level of microbes in the environment. Now, when we look at how this technology works, this is a healthy E. coli. These studies were done. Uh, these are scanning electron uh, microcrafts done at NASA. This is a healthy E. coli, and generally we use heat uh, to sterilize, and you can see what is the status of that E. coli in two hours. When it's exposed to ozone, this is the state of E. coli, and when we look at uh, use of the plasma technology in this virus, the patent environment is cold plasma technology. This is what happens to E. coli, and this is in micro settings. So, as I mentioned earlier, when these organisms or uh, particles containing the organisms pass through, the plasma, cold plasma coils, 
they are destroyed within a few seconds. And this is the mechanism of destruction. So initially there is electroporation and the entire the organisms get etched. Then there is that because the plasma releases electrons, these electrons bombard on that organism and totally destroys the cell membrane as well as the genetic material. And then there is photo irradiation. So the total bonds in whatever all the types of bonds within that cell are destroyed. And finally, there is oxidation. And all this happens in less than uh, in 0.002 seconds. So this is the very quick method of destruction of the organisms in plasma. And so also fungal spores, we know how, how horrible it is in fungal, fungal infections occur because the spores are very difficult to get rid of. And here too, we can see the state of the Aspergillus liquor spore after it exposed to the virus plasma. So as we can see, it works on bacteria, it works on fungi. And uh, bacteriophage MS2 has been used as a surrogate for SARS-CoV-2 uh, since it is also an uh, rRNA and in fact a slightly smaller in size. And what it was found was that when exposure to about 10 minutes to the, uh, to the no virus cold plasma technology, we find that there's a dramatic log reduction in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, surrogate bacteriophage MS2. But if you look at what happens in the uncontrolled environment, it is not. So it clearly shows that it, is, it does not discriminate between bacteria and viruses. Whatever the size, these are also destroyed by the plasma technology. So has these been used in hospital settings? And for the last couple of years, uh, this is a summary of how it has been used in hospital settings. Uh, here you can see that they report in a large hospital where they tried it in a 900 bedded hospital for 16 weeks. There was a 75% reduction in surface bacterial count, 97% in uh, the methylene, methicillin resistant staph aureus. Uh, also, the fungal count reduced 93% in the study done in Hungary. Uh, the hospital acquired infection rate dropped to 23%, dropped by 3%. And there's again, Clostridium is another uh, awful of, uh, infection in hospital acquired settings, there's a 100% reduction. So, if you go ahead to see, we have consistently seen that even when they looked at the presence of contamination of floors and tables, which is something which we fear in uh, SARS-CoV-2, we find again that there is a re reduction in these uh, in, in large hospital settings. So this shows that in clinical trials, it can be used. Uh, as, as, as I said earlier, since it is the, the plasma is, is all very well contained, there is no harm to the people in the room. Uh, in India, we have the major concern of mycobacterium tuberculosis which is not that much in the West. So we did a very, very preliminary study to see what happens. And uh, so there was a chamber which was created and in this chamber uh, was exposed the mycobacterium, a clinical iso isolate of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And you can see positive growth in LG medium after 15 days and in GIT medium. However, when the chamber, uh, the chamber was exposed to the cold plasma technology uh, through the no virus, and again, the air sample was taken, there was absolutely no growth given after 45 days in both the media. So it clearly shows that it is capable of destroying mycobacterium tuberculosis too. Uh, then we did a study because the labor OT in, in a hospital, a public general hospital in Mumbai, uh, the labor OT, as we know, has a lot of people walking in and out and also is at a higher risk of infections. So in this study, uh, Dr. Mulin Dubale, the microbiologist, actually took samples every uh, at the first sample, one hour, two hour samples, and then took further samples, switched on the machine, the no virus machine. And then again, took samples on day seven, day 14, day 21, at one hour, two hours, and four hours. The machine, machine was switched on after day one, and then maintained till day 21. And so four samples were taken on day seven, 14, and 21. And subsequently, the machine was switched off and uh, the samples, air samples were taken earlier. Now, let us see what happened was on day zero, this was the microbial growth uh, in, in the average growth of the three samples they could taken on day zero. Day seven, the mean colony forming units dropped. They further dropped on day 14. They further dropped on day 21. On day 21, the machine was switched off and we can see that again, the colony forming units increased. Uh, so this showed that, yes, we could use this cold plasma air purification system safely in any kind of setting. The advantage is that, it, uh, and this is just a visual of the microbial growth. This is after the air purifier was on, the uh, cold plasma no virus was on, you can see the level of microbial growth. 
and then you don't even really need to estimate the colony count. You can see the level of microbial growth after the internet was switched off. The advantage is that we can use this called plasma technology. It is just a plug and play. It has minimal maintenance. And, uh, and it, uh, unlike some of the technologies which require AC all the time, we don't need all that. So it becomes really cost effective in, in all kinds of small hospitals or large hospitals. So to summarize, we do have uh, various technologies for disinfection. The air filtration uh, technologies which are currently in use have extensive maintenance and therefore become uh, difficult. And this cold plasma technology can augment the existing technologies without requiring any, uh, any more modifications to the existing one. So I Uh, thank you, Dr. Mehta. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we are, we are uh, actually a little out of time now. Uh, I will uh, request for the questions, if any. Uh, on the chat, there's one question from Dr. Mehta. And it's a, it's a question I think we just covered everyone. Uh, the question is a simple one uh, for the medical officers. Uh, when you have to treat the enemy, so what is, what is the dilemma when you treat the enemy? So uh, that, that's, a very, that's a question which I think haunted most of us uh, all our lives. Uh, may, may I ask the uh, request, uh, uh, General uh, uh, Arubhum Chadav, uh, Arubhum to answer this, please? Sure. Uh, Ask him to repeat the question. What's the question? Can I uh, please ask the question once again, please? Uh, yeah, the, the question is a simple one that, no, it's from Dr. Matha, that if you have to treat the enemy, what, what, is, what is the dilemma if you treat the enemy soldiers uh, when they're injured in battle field? Dilemma to treat enemy soldiers. Dilemma to treat enemy soldiers. No, it's not, uh, sir, as you rightly brought out in your own statement, sir, when you uh, concluded my uh, talk, sir, that when the terrorist and the, uh, this thing, our own soldier came together and both were injured and both required uh, treatment, then the dilemma comes whether the terrorist will be given attention first or our own wounded colleague whose wound may not be that much severe. Secondly, whether the medical resources, scarce medical resources that are available on the point of injury with the doctor and his uh, team, if that is not adequate, how much of it should be spent on the uh, insurgent or the uh, uh, insurgent and how much should be spent on our own soldier? So these are two dilemmas that come up to the doctor at, at that point of time, sir. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, possibly, please carry, please carry. Uh, we can address it, sir, by having clear-cut direct directions in the beginning of the of the operation itself that what is going to be our aim and possibly beefing up our resources at the point of injury so that by, by, by having a, a prior idea as to how what is the uh, quantum of casualty and what is the quantum of uh, problem that is going to occur, you carry adequate resources with you and treat both of them on the ground at the same time and evacuate both of them. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you. I think you have answered it very well. Uh, uh, are there any any other questions up there? Because they're not not. Uh... Uh, sir, uh, uh, General Rada, sir, you are unmute, unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. Sir, uh, if you go to discuss button on the right. Yeah, I, I went there. And go to uh, and go to the tab audience public. I, I've done that. There's only one question which I could see. No, at the end, there is a question from General Kanish. Yeah, okay. Sir, uh, what is the DJP. cost of this filter or purifier? Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I will leave it to Dilip, uh, Mr. Dilip Patel to answer that in the subsequent presentation. Since I'm only involved okay. in the scientific and the You can answer state. directly so also. I'm, I'm not very familiar. You can answer. You can give yeah, it directly so to I'm, General Kanitkar also. Okay. Okay. It, I, I think it remains for me to just uh, conclude uh, the session. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we uh, to, uh, no, uh, cross uh, the time limits. Time is exceedingly important. Uh, uh, everyone is uh, uh, a busy man out here. Uh, and our medical uh, core is the busiest. I know that uh, as a fact. And uh, especially in COVID times. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. My special thanks to the DGS ASMS uh, and, and the speakers. Uh, 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 thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, good session. Uh, I now hand over for the second session to A. Marshall uh, Pavan Kapoor.
just a minute sir just a minute sir so there was a problem with my presentation i've just uploaded it there so whoever want wants it can have a look since the beginning part okay, thank, you, thank you thank you thank you dr madam it's uploaded and uh, it can be downloaded thank you, thank you.